6.30 by my computer watch. Scott McCullough, the planning director. I opened the meeting tonight because we have a bit of an unusual circumstance and that both our chair and vice chair are at the National American Planning Association Conference in New Orleans. So you have to first elect a temporary planning commission chair for the April 23rd meeting. The chair and vice chair will be back Wednesday or at least anticipated to be back on, uh, on Wednesday. So for tonight's meeting, if you would start your business by <coughs> electing a chair to run the show. And so we'll take nominations for a <laughs> chair to run the show. This is well, weird. I'll Commissioner Kelly since you already sit in the chair. <laughs> Any other nominations? <laughs> okay, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of that, say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously, Mr. Chair. All right. Welcome. Yes, temporary chair. Let's make sure we say that every time. <laughs> I want to welcome the public to the Lawrence Douglas County Planning Commission meeting for 423-18. Um, we have a full agenda tonight. Um, and we'll start with our uh, minutes. Do I have a motion? They were in your packet. Do I have a motion for the minutes from March 28th? Move we approve the action summary for, for the March 28th meeting? Yes. I'll second that. <laughs> Commissioner Sinclair seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 7-0. Moving on to committee reports. The committees that have met over the past month. <clears throat> I'll share that the comprehensive plan um, committee continues to meet. Um, this, I think we met twice since we last met. Yeah, we did meet twice. We're going through the issue, issue, issue action report and uh, uh, sort of in more detail. Um, it will again come to you um, here hopefully soon, maybe June, is that where we're sort of projecting out? Maybe even September, right? Yes. Oh, not June, no, that would not be June. totally crazy. The yeah. steering committee still meets in June, maybe even July. And then we'll, we're, we're talking about maybe doing a, a work sure. session with planning commission, city commission, and county commission, just to present it. And then it needs to go through planning commission, city commission, county commission uh, for the, the hearings and the comments. So lots of public process left to go. I would really advise you if you haven't been on the comprehensive plan website to take you know take some time and spend some time looking through that so that when it comes to us it's maybe not so much to read and take on <coughs> there's no other committees communications from the public we did have a late edition email is that correct Danny with some communications that were added to the packet so Please take a look at that. Um, any written communications from staff, planning commissioners, or other commissioners? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Any written action, waiver request, determinations made by the city engineer? No. Um, at this point, we ask for what's called ex parte communications. Um, our planning commission wants to make sure that everybody hears the same information. So we ask if any commissioners has had communications with a member of the public on any of our agenda items, we ask them to share that information with the entire commission at this time. Anybody have any ex parte communications? Seeing none, are there any declarations of extensions from a specific agenda item? Seeing none, at this time, and this is fairly new for us as part of our bylaws. We invite public comment at this time. Um, this would be relating to an item that is not on our agenda. We will have time for items that are specifically on our agenda, but if you would like to speak to the commission about any other planning item, now would be the time. Great. So we have five items and one miscellaneous we'll take one a and b together would that be correct scott i think so one a and b together yes sir um for the public we're going to walk i'm going to walk you quickly through our process here so first we're going to hear a report from a staff member on the specific item on item one we'll have the two reports probably together 
After that, the applicant will be able to make a statement, then we'll open up for public comment. We invite you um, to share any ideas. We do keep it at three minutes. We have new bylaws here, so stay with me. I am acting chair. Let's make sure <laughs> temporary <laughs> chair. Three minutes for comment for each person. Um, uh, we'll have a little clock running there. Hopefully you can read the clock, I can read the clock, and I won't have to cut you off at the end of three minutes. Once that's done and we've completed all the public comment, we'll invite the applicant back up to respond to the, to the uh, public comment. We do encourage you not to have a debate back and forth between the public and the applicant. We'll sort of control that up here. After the applicants had a chance to respond, we'll have some conversation up here. We may have questions for the applicant, the public, staff, each other. Um, and then uh, hopefully we have some motions and some voting and we'll do that for each item. So without any further ado, let's begin with item 1A, which is a preliminary plat for the Oread West number 17 at 1601 and 1701 Research Park and also for a special permit use for Bridgehaven at 1601-1701 Research Park Drive. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Becky Pepper. I'm with the Planning Department. The subject properties are located to the south of Bob Billings Parkway on the west side of Research Park Drive, indicated here with this red star. More specifically, the properties are located within the Oread West Research Park area, which is identified as an industrial business research park. This business park extends north and south of Bob Billings Parkway and is primarily located on the west side of Wakarusa. The subject properties are zoned Industrial Business Park District, as are the surrounding properties to the north, south, and east. The property is located to the west and on the south side of West 18th Street are zoned for single-family residential. As such, the land use in the area consists of single-family residences to the west and research facilities, medical facilities, and office uses located to the east uh, along uh, Wakarusa Drive. The immediate properties uh, surrounding the subject properties to the north, east, and south are currently undeveloped. The proposed preliminary plat combines a platted lot with an unplatted parcel to the south to create one lot. The zoning regulations as they apply to this preliminary plat are discussed in the staff report. The preliminary plat was found to be con uh, compliant with the standards of the subdivision regulations of the de development code. And there are new easements that are being dedicated with this plat. They include utility and drainage easements that are shown highlighted here. Um, there are also easements that uh, currently exist on the platted lot. You'll see these are extensions of um, those existing easements. So we have a utility easement that runs along the east property line. Um, and then there is a new access easement um, that's being proposed with this preliminary plat. And that will provide access to this southern undeveloped um, parcel if that's developed in the future. The second piece of the development proposal is a request to extend the, the extended care facility general use. As previously mentioned, the subject properties are zoned industrial business park district and the extended care facility general use is a permitted use in the IVP district um, with approval of a special use permit. The special use permit for the extended care facility use was uh, previously approved by the City Commission in 2012. Um, with the approval of that SUP, the northern portion, the northern property was developed with two one-story buildings for the purpose of providing care to individuals who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Um, in total, the existing buildings contain 22 bedrooms and there's an existing parking area to the north that contains 15 parking spaces. And this proposed development would include the addition of a third building. Uh, this is a copy of the site plan and I've highlighted that proposed third building. Now, that building will be consistent in the residential style of the existing buildings. Uh, other site improvements um, would include uh, landscaping improvements, a stormwater detention area located in the uh, southwest corner of the property and a, a new parking area. There will also be internal pathways uh, that will provide connection to the existing buildings as well as to the existing sidewalk that runs along Research Park Drive. 
A staff heard comments from nearby residents regarding um, parking that's uh, occurring in Research Park Drive. I believe that that's staff parking that's using the, the, the roadway for parking. Um, as I mentioned, the site plan includes a new parking area to the south and that'll uh, provide 20, 26 additional parking spaces. So in total, with the existing parking area and the proposed parking area, the development will contain 41 parking spaces. And this number exceeds the, the, the amount required by the development code by 29 spaces. The applicant indicated that the excess parking will provide additional spaces for caretakers and staff during, during shift changes. And the land development code requires that the impacts of excessive excess parking be mitigated through the use of storm, uh, storm drainage best pack management practices. And the applicant and the, engine, uh, and the stormwater engineer have been working on best methods for mitigation, uh, although a method has not been identified at this time. And lastly, I wanted to mention that uh, the new development will include trash enclosures. Uh, currently, uh, trash is um, picked up with, by roll-off carts um, that are um, put in the street on trash day. Um, the new development will have a permanent location for trash pickup. The facility aims to provide care to individuals suffering from Alzheimer's disease, disease in a residential type setting. This size and style of the buildings provide a transition between the existing uh, res residential development to the west and future non-residential development to the east. And the site also contains some wooded area that a uh, portion of which will be uh, uh, will remain to provide some buffering area between the existing the, the proposed development and the existing single family residential so with that staff approves recommends approval of the preliminary plat based on findings of fact in the staff report and staff recommends approval of the special use permit <coughs> for extended care facility general use and forwarding the request to the city commission with a recommendation for approval Subject to the following conditions, provision of a photometric plan and approval by the stormwater engineer of best management practices to mit mitigate the ex excess parking. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Becky. We may have some here in a bit. Do we have an applicant here or a representative of the applicant? Good evening. My name is Joy Ray. I'm a landscape architect with Paul Werner Architects here on with the applicant, actually, he's here if we have questions for him later as far as operations or thing go, things go. Um, Becky did, she pretty much summarized the project. We're just excited uh, that, that uh, Robert has found a niche that's been able to serve the you know, Alzheimer's community in Lawrence and is really doing well and is able to expand uh, his business and continue to serve more people. Um, like Becky said, we anticipate this, the site itself being friendlier in the neighborhood with the addition of more parking spaces um, and the trash, which seem to be the main things that most neighbors were concerned about. So um, I don't really have anything other to add than what Becky did, but if you have questions later um, regarding anything, we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. <coughs> this is a public hearing item, so we'll open it up for public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on item 1A or 1B from the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. I won't invite the applicant back up to speak on nothing and bring it up to the commission if they have any questions of staff, the public, or the applicant. All right, I got a question. So how many beds are in the current facility? Do we know that? Yes, building A, well, building A has 10 bedrooms mm -hmm. and building B has 12 bedrooms. And then the new building would have 12 bedrooms. Okay, so say that one more time. I was doing math while you said that. I'm not very good at math. <laughs> The uh, building A has 10 bedrooms, mm -hmm. building B has 12, and then the new one will have 12. So there's, there's 24 current bedrooms, is that right? I'm just trying to gauge why we've got people parking on the street when this was built after our code. 
so we should it, it sort of seems like a case to sort of check our parking numbers here if we've got too many people parking if we add a building you guys following my logic here if we add a building and we're off on our parking numbers here we may still be off on our parking <coughs> so maybe that's a question for the applicant as well to talk a little bit about your current parking situation and how this project's going to solve all future parking situations. Bridge Haven as well as Beckmeister. Beckmeister is the real estate holding company for it. Um, I was not the developer on the original. I did do the second building. Um, each building ha has four staff members typically, but there is a shift change. Um, twice a day where they'll be doubled up for 20 or 30 minutes and that's where we get some of our our parking issues um, so we chose when we purchase this other property to double up our parking from 15 to 24 additional ones so that we can get all the employees off the street um, we've also as a courtes courtesy to some of the family members during time of decline more family members tend to show up to be with their loved ones, so we um, have been reserving those front parking spots uh, during those times. But we feel that by adding the additional parking for for staff, we've eliminated that problem. The other big problem was the trash, because during trash day we'd have maybe 15 dumpsters out there, and it was very unsightly. So we're adding this large dumpster. <coughs> oh, and you asked about beds. The first building has 10 bedrooms, but two of them are semi-private, so it's 12. So it'll be 12, 12, and 12 beds. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? So are the people that are parking, I assume they're parking on Research Park Drive? <coughs> yes, they are currently, well, some are parking on the parking existing 15 stalls and some are parking on the streets right now there's no other businesses on that street um, but it's not ideal without the additional parking was that your question yep that's okay that's fine uh, it was more of a transportation thought <laughs> what is research park drive as, as far as what kind of street is that a collector How many, don't go anywhere. <laughs> so how many of your residents drive there? None. These, um, all of our residents are suffering with various forms of illness, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, stroke victims. Right. They all need full-time care. And so none of them drive. So the parking is only for family members and staff members? That's correct. Okay. But during shift change, it looks like a lot of cars during a, the 15 minute switch. And that's where the eyesore really, really becomes prominent. Okay, thank you. So did you say, did you say, was it tw 29 over what you needed? That was uh, 29. Over the code requires. Right. Yes. Okay. Sounds, sounds excessively over. <laughs> okay. All right. I just find it, this is just more of a comment, but if we have 24 and we have one space for three beds, that's eight parking spaces for three beds. Am I calculating correctly? And I'm sure during a shift change, he has more than eight people there. So it, it just makes me worry, are we doing the right calculation there a little? I mean, I don't know where we got the magic number of one per three beds, so. Well, I think it's timely because we're in a parking amendment, so mm -hmm. we can look at that ratio and we do a little research on that and figure out what the right number is. Because anybody, I mean, it's great that he's adding spaces, but if anybody else was building an extended care facility, they could put, you know, essentially 12 spots mm -hmm. there for 36 beds. Right. So right. that seems low to me. 
what it what the code doesn't probably take into account well it doesn't take into account the staffing mm -hmm. but especially if you have multiple small build smaller buildings versus a larger building you may have even more staff mm -hmm. to change out on those shifts so um. okay more questions more comments hopefully smarter than mine motions I can I make a comment chair temporary chair thank you uh, I, I think it's worth recognizing uh, the applicant for though it's not required retaining some of the mature trees that are on the property I think this has happened once before since I've been on the Commission where a uh, an applicant in, a, in an area that's zoned such that you don't have to maintain any stands and mature trees has nevertheless done so. Um, one question I have though is, that's part of the preliminary plat, is that, is that something that can be altered? Though they're saying that they'll retain some of the mature trees that are there, it can be, at a later date, it, it can be clear cut. Yeah, it, it can through the, through the process. Okay. there's still a buffer yard requirement okay. so it's satisfying part of that so if something were to be taken down they'd have to put put up the code required buffer yard in right. its place okay don't be shy about your motions we can always <laughs> still discuss after a motion has been made Commissioner Butler. I uh, move that we recommend approval of the preliminary plat for Orient West number 17. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. And Mr. Chair, yes. you're actually approving the preliminary plat, not recommending its approval. Oh. Just a small detail. Then I would amend my motion to state that. Please. <laughs> Okay, any other comment on item number 1A? All those in favor, raise your hand. Pass it 7-0. Moving on to item 2A. Commissioner Butler, would you like to continue? Sure. Um, I move that we recommend, or that we approve the extent. Nope. Recommend approval. Recommend approval, mm -hmm. that's, okay. Recommend approval of the extended care facility general use located at 1601 and 1701 Research Park Drive and forward the request to the City Commission with a recommendation of approval subject to the conditions listed in the, listed in the staff report. Excellent. We have a motion. Commissioner Butler. I have a second. Commissioner Culver seconds. Any more discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Pass it 7-0. Thank you. Thank you to the applicant. We're going to move on to the next item, which is item number two. Item number two is for a special use permit for Bishop Seabury at 1420 Clinton Parkway. Good evening again. My name is Becky Pepper with the Planning Department. I am filling in for Sandy Day, who is at the uh, planning conference this evening. The subject property is located in West Lawrence on the north side of Clinton Parkway. Uh, it's located uh, roughly uh, between Castle Drive and Wakarusa Drive. The property is zoned RM12, a multi-dwelling <coughs> residential district, and is adjacent to multi-dwelling residential district to the east. The area along the north is developed with conventional single-family residential lots zoned RS7, single-dwelling residential, and attached multi-dwelling townhouses as part of a planned unit development to the north along Wimbledon Drive and to the west. The property abuts Clinton Parkway and to the south to the south as, and, um, as well as a vacant neighborhood commercial zoning, uh, developing duplex uh, zoned RSO, single, uh, single dwelling residential office, and a multi-dwelling uh, Remington Square apartments to the south. And, and this area to the south is part of the Inverness uh, Park neighborhood. 
The subject property is developed with Bishop Seabury Academy, Academy and which ha houses grades six through 12. The site contains two buildings, two portable classrooms, four tennis courts, um, an outdoor pool, a multi-purpose athletic field, and a parking area uh, near Clinton Parkway that uh, houses 105 parking spaces. This special use permit facilitates expansion of the existing school use with the proposed building ad addition that will be completed in two phases. The first phase of development would consist of removing the, the uh, portable classrooms and uh, the demolition of the, the tennis courts, the pool, and um, a portion of the existing building. Uh, the building <coughs> addition constructed in the first phase would be this center, center portion, um, and it would connect the two existing um, buildings. And the second phase um, of construction would include um, this uh, an extension, a building uh, addition on the west, um, some building additions on to the east uh, existing building, as well as a new parking facility on the north side. The site plan submitted with this special use permit application is required to meet the site plan requirements of the land development code. The zoning regulations as they apply to the site plan are discussed in the staff report. And the site plan was found to be compliant with the standards with the exception of the following items. The site plan, plan proposes 126 parking spaces, which is 16 more spaces than what is required by the parking requirements of the Land Development Code. Um, the applicant indicated that um, this is because uh, this is a private school, it has more of a regional reach, and that students um, uh, who attend this school are coming from um, various areas within the region. And that a high rate of students in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades um, are, drive to school. And staff acknowledges that the applicant's request for additional parking and recommends that the site plan be revised per the approval of the city stormwater engineer to implement a small um, bioretention cell to meet the mit mitigation requires requirements that are necessary when there's excess parking. The applicant also requested a, wa a waiver from the bicycle parking requirements of the development code um, based on the same concept that a majority of the students commute to the school by automobile and don't live within two, a two mile radius of the school. And the city engineer concurred with this assessment. Um, there are current, the site currently has uh, six bicycle parking spaces and staff recommends that a minimum of six additional spaces be provided so that there are a total of 12 bicycle spaces uh, on site. The proposed site plan meets or exceeds the required street tree, uh, interior parking lot landscaping and buffer yard requirements. Uh, this, uh, slide here is showing the proposed landscape plan on the site plan. Uh, a waiver was requested to reduce the peri peri perimeter parking lot landscaping requirements. And the code, code requires that parking lots be screened from view from street right of ways with a minimum of one tree per 25 uh, linear feet. The code also requires that landscape be planted eight feet from water and sanitary sewer lines. Now there are underground utilities located to this south of the existing parking lot that inhibit um, the ability for this site to meet the perimeter parking lot landscaping requirements for the trees. However, it is possible to plant small shrubs in, the, in some locations and the proposed site plan pro uh, provides additional shrubs that will screen some of the parking area along Clinton Parkway and that's uh, these uh, shrubs that are highlighted here. Staff recommends approval of the special use permit for Bishop Seabury, a school use located at 2112 Clinton Parkway, and forwarding the request to the City Commission with a recommendation of approval, uh, including the, the waivers that are listed in the staff report. And subject to the following conditions, or the, subject to the conditions that are also listed in the staff report. With that, I will. Uh, stand for questions. I also wanted to note that our stormwater engineer and a utilities engineer are, are both here to answer any questions that you may have that they have more knowledge on. Excellent. Thank you. We have the applicant or representative of the applicant. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Lori Bowman, principal architect with BBN Architects. I'm uh, Don Schwong, head of school at Bishop Seabury Academy. 
So we're really excited about this project. It's sort of been on our horizon for a couple years now. And um, once Albemar was done with the use of that swimming pool, Bishop Seabury knew they wanted to use that precious piece of land as a way to expand their, their facility. So we went through um, pretty extensive campus master plan in order to get to this point and um, feel like we have approached this very sensitively with um, two proposed phases, one of which if we uh, pass through this process would start this summer. Um, we're fine with all the conditions that have been stipulated here. We know that there have been uh, many letters from neighbors, some of which came really late today. And so we're going to respond to those comments as best we can. We're, we're, there's a little bit of clarity missing on some things, but we're going to do our best tonight. Should I, is it appropriate for me to go ahead and address those before? Okay. Um, I know there were several construction phase concerns that were asked or, or requested in the letter. Um, something about that the extensive construction phase of 12 to 18 months, it's really our intent to have the project completely finished by fall of um, 2019 for the students, but that start date is still pending. This process and getting through a demolition phase, there's a lot of things that are still pending, so we felt that it was a reasonable time frame for 12 to 18 months for this large of a project. Um, there were some questions about construction staging and where that would occur. Um, I will say that the majority of the staging is probably going to happen from the south side of the lot. There's a, a little frontage road that borders the southern property line and takes you around the southern classroom building, Reese Hall. We will demolish the tennis courts as part of this project, but we'll also be using one of those tennis courts for construction phasing, for unloading of material, and for the job trailer. But all that will be mended when the project is done, <clears throat> and there'll be new turf over that whole area. So there's not going to be a lot of traffic going up and around the east and north sides of the building. I would say the majority of the construction traffic is going to be along the south, and they'll work the construction from that south and west side. Um, the contractor will be totally responsible for securing the construction site with construction fencing. I mean, we're all really tuned to this being a, a school environment and children everywhere, and so uh, construction fencing will surround all of the construction site, and even if there are remote portions happening elsewhere on the property, all of that will be secured as well. So there seemed to be some concern about um, people being able to wander into the construction area, that absolutely <laughs> won't be the case. And, and the construction companies know that they are totally responsible for that. Uh, there was a question about whether the pools would be removed in their entirety or we would just put dirt in them. We've had uh, <coughs> PSI services do a full soils test analysis on the property to, to understand what soils conditions we'll be designing for for the new footings. They've also given us complete recommendations on what that backfill material needs to be. All the pool will come out. We will not leave anything there. Um, and we'll come back in with this um, engineered fill material. <clears throat> there was concern about noise during the construction um, period. And um, the contractor will, will typically work Monday through Friday, 7 AM to 5.30 PM. Um, if they get behind, sometimes they need to pick up a half a day on Saturday, and that would be 7 a.m. to noon, but nobody likes to work on Saturday, so not unless things get really pushed up against a really tight time frame. Um, there was a lot of concern about landscaping, some wanting more, some wanting less, and so I think, you know, maybe the best way to handle that is for us to meet again with the neighbors. They brought up several concerns at the last minute today that Don might speak to. We, he had his uh, facilities um, person go out and walk the property line and look at the condition of some of the trees and plants that were mentioned in letters today. And they'll be addressing some of those. Do you want to talk to them? Yes. Um, first off, I believe there was a reference to a line of juniper bushes. Um, I believe it's references, I think I know wh wh what the items are in question and those are far enough away from the construction site, those would not be an issue and my facilities manager believes it's in, those are in great shape and there's no use in um, taking those out, which um, was what one neighbor asked for. Um, the, 
There is a tree that was mentioned in a letter we received today or, or noted today that is on the far uh, west uh, side of the property that um, my facilities managers and the property of trying to take care of some limbs on there and bagworms are an issue off and on throughout our territory. So uh, uh, th those are, are, are not issues. Uh, so I, I don't know if there are any beyond those. Did I miss anything? We are adding a substantial amount of landscaping, as you saw from the, the um, highlighted plan that Becky just showed you. Um, and, and it does meet the, the requirements. And there are actually, there's one giant tree that the neighbors really wanted us to take out. And so that has been removed learned of some of these things before and after our neighborhood meeting so if there are extenuating comments that are still coming up we're happy to meet with the neighbors and work something out on the landscaping um, let's see there were concerns about the looks of the building from the north side um, we don't have our our building completely designed but it will be consistent with the look of the school that's there now um, you know, we have the existing main classroom building and Reese, and so there's kind of a mix of materials. We're certainly not going to be introducing new materials. It'll probably be a reuse of that and the same style of windows, but, you know, it's not going to be something that really stands out in contrast to that. Um, I think that was all. There's some questions that we have um, our civil engineer here to respond to, too. Great. Thank you. We might have some here in a little bit. Okay. So this is a public hearing item. I'll invite members of the public who'd like to speak on item two to come to the mic now. Please give us your name and where you live and sign in. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Bob Banning. Uh, my condo is 4211 Wimbledon, so it's square in the middle of the building that sits directly behind the school. Uh, my son lives there. He has a disability, so he has uh, staff that's there in and out all the time. What I've seen in the two and a half years that I've been in this building is the population there is generally older. Uh, many are retired. Uh, some are very working toward retirement. They enjoy spending time on their back porches. Uh, they like the environment. They, uh, they enjoy, again, spending time with friends. As I looked at the plot that was laid out, uh, I see that we're being treated as a multi-use building and when I spoke with Sandra Day she was kind enough to explain that from the city's perspective currently they see multi-use buildings like a commercial apartment and a group of townhomes equally and when they look at the landscaping and the barriers between uh, commercial buildings and, and uh, family homes. So what I would say to you is if that is the case then I would recommend you go back and relook at your procedures because I think you'll find that those single-family homeowners who happen to have connected walls and happen to work together to try to maintain their property uh, should get the same level of respect as single-family homeowners uh, particularly if you've looked as we did some years ago looking at toward trying to get a more senior friendly community because they tend to live in these kind of facilities. <clears throat> so if you stood in the back of my uh, condo today and looked at the proposed building plan, the only really, as I can see it, the only really landscaping that's been put in there is what's been put in by the uh, Townhome Association. I don't see any landscaping uh, directly behind the building uh, on the north side. I see some in the northwest corner where they're going to take the tree down. So I would just ask that you go back and look at that and look at the setback, look at the landscaping requirements, so that, so that whatever we see when we sit on our back porch is at least reasonable and not like the, you know, the backside of a strip mall with a few windows and doors and a bush or two in front. Uh, second item of interest for me is, is quickly is drainage. If you look at the property now, and I walked it with, I think it's Matt Price and Chris Weiss uh, here a few days ago, on a normal day there is no issue. But when we get two inches of water or an inch of water in a very short period of time, according to what uh, Matt told us, we drain 174 acres through that little creek. Uh, what it does is it really erodes the bank. Uh, in addition, we have some issues with the way the, the approaches were made from the street into the parking lot, which is having you know, basically street water flow through our uh, north side of our condo and into the stream. And it cuts a channel where it goes into the stream. So as we add this new building from Bishop Seabury, they have a drainage pipe that comes around the west side of the building and crosses the north side of the building and comes into the uh, uh, intermittent stream that's down there. 
Uh, and I just don't know how much more water this is going to add. Um, but at this stage in the game, whenever we get a significant rain, significant snow, uh, it just erodes the ditch. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure you sign in there, Bob. Should be a sign-in sheet right there. Other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item? see this right here but I bought my own awesome uh, this is the one that my wife uh, uses when I'm in trouble and uh, so I'll probably respond to it better <laughs> my name is Tom Tate uh, I live at 4215 Wimbledon Drive which is directly behind the Seabur the Seabur uh, the Seabury uh, Academy and we are a complex of 12 units uh, uh, in two buildings on four acres density is sparse only one and a quarter persons per unit, and most of us are single and retired. Some of us are over 80 years old. Our east building backs up to the proposed improvement, the large building. The approximate distance between the patios and the new construction is only about 45 to 50 feet. The south side of the west building faces the tennis courts. Uh, this is from my patio. Uh, this is the West Building, and I'll get to this in just a moment. The, um, presently, the uh, entire campus shields us from Clinton Parkway. Uh, it helps a little bit on the noise, and it definitely uh, helps on the traffic, any traffic coming from Wimbledon Drive to uh, Clinton Parkway and the other way. Uh, from our perspective, this construction process, from the start to finish, will drastically change the landscape, not to mention our inconvenience during the excavation construction process. In my, later data, in my letter dated April the 19th, uh, I had several concerns. Scheduling, the sanitary sewer pipe, the appearance, property values, and uh, uh, drainage. The, uh, uh, I only have time to talk about a couple, but first I want to refer you to SUP item. This is the staff report number 214 on page 7. The staff does not re re recommend a time limit on the special use permit. I realize that it's scheduled for a year and a half. That's a long time for us to be witnessing excavation and building. Um, an article in the journal indicated that uh, the financing has not been completed, uh, suggesting that it might go beyond that period. With that in mind, I am asking that uh, you consider limiting the completion save the West classroom uh, expansion to one and a half years from the date of uh, uh, the uh, SUP approval within two months by the Lawrence City Commissioners. That is to say that uh, assuming that they would receive the approval uh, within two months that uh, the project would, uh, uh, would have a year and a half from that date. If the project was not completed then you would require a renewal of the uh, uh, special use permit uh, application. The second is value. Uh, on page uh, 13, item 3, uh, the staff, your staff uh, s states that the substantial dimin uh, diminution of other property values in the area is not anticipated. We disagree. Uh, after consulting with at least three realtors with intimate knowledge of this area, one being a developer, the consensus was that during the construction phase and thereafter, properties, buyers will be reluctant to purchase. Uh, thereby increasing the sale time and the price and decreasing the price. Another factor affecting marketing is a close proximity of buildings on the east side and the open area from Clinton Parkway to our property. Uh, if we were to buy a marketing study, uh, or if, uh, it's too expensive to, uh, uh, to consider buying one, but I will say that with 35 years of sales and real estate management experience in Kansas and a dozen other states, I can safely say that we're going to re, uh, realize a 10 to 15 percent discount from an ordinarily expected sales price, uh, which I don't think would be out of reason 
this, translate, this translates to about fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. In the past five to six years, more than half of our townhomes have turned over, most selling within one month or so. However, presently, this uh, one unit has been listed for at least two months uh, in a tight market and is still unsold. The appearance. With regard to the east building, because our townhomes are measurably close to the proposed building, the rear of which will face our backyards and our patios, we recommend a barrier of fast-growing durable trees at the rear of the new building, about 150 feet, that would border onto our property. The, uh, uh, we recommend that uh, uh, Seabury uh, consider uh, arbor vitae plants, which are planted four to five, uh, four to five feet apart. And if you'll look, um, uh, let's see. This is an example of those. I have uh, uh, some other ones too. Let's see. Okay, this is one off of uh, Inverness, and they pretty well hide uh, the house. The uh, uh, this is the final one. I'll explain that in just a moment. When you get to the west property, uh, the uh, removal of the tennis courts. Uh, will uh, expose that property to our units, particularly on the west side. We are proposing that with that in mind that uh, you consider that uh, um, uh, uh, installing a fence. Uh, we would like it to be a fence similar to the one that you see here and very similar to the one that surrounds the pool. Uh, Tom. This, this fence would be 14, 400 feet from our western border to the new building on our west side. Tom. This is important. Uh, we uh, uh, were exposed. We weren't exposed before. So your wife's going to be really disappointed that your timer's not working because we're at five minutes. Am I supposed to press a button on this thing? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad we weren't relying on that one. Do you have much more to tell us? Uh, if you'll give me 15 seconds. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're not just neighbors living next uh, to the construction of a mere single-family dwelling. In my opinion, we are uniquely collateral damage, and I don't say that offensively, but collateral damage to a, a substantial measure caused by a project that could last years. Our people are genuinely concerned. We consider our position in this matter as best compromised and request sufficient relief to mitigate the problems relating to our exposure. Our security and our minimization of inconvenience stated differently, please, we request that you put yourself in our shoes and that you come out and see what I'm telling you or what we have told you is true. Uh, I might mention also that due to our past favorable relationship with Seabury, uh, we applaud and appreciate their mission to improve the school and wish them success in their venture. Frankly, they offer a value service to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item? Hello, my name is Hillary Griggs, and I am a junior at Bishop Seabury Academy. Um, I have been a student at Seabury since I was sixth grade. In sixth grade, since I was 12 years old, um, and as you can imagine, consequently, the school is an incredibly important part of my life. Now, I'd just like to um, use my voice, which is, I, think, I think is unique in this room, because although we do have administrators of the school here, people who are very familiar with the school, I have a unique perspective as a student and someone who knows how this project will directly affect the student body of the school. Now, I know you've heard a lot about this project, um, but from everything from the landscaping to the drainage. However, I think we need to look at the bigger picture and look at the fact that um, as a student, I take three out of eight of my classes in portable classrooms to the west of the school. Uh, we have multiple classrooms at Seabury that are shared by two teachers um, in which scheduling conflicts arise because two classes cannot happen in the same room at the same time. As the school has continued to grow uh, since its beginning in 1997, there has been an increasing need for a larger space at the current location. Um, now, I hear the voices of neighbors, um, such as the gentleman who came before me, um, and I agree that it's unavoidable that there will be, of course, some extent of minor inconvenience to neighbors, because that's just what happens when there's construction. I think we can all agree with that. There is no perfect construction project that has no effect on anyone whatsoever. However, I firmly believe 
that any um, possible inconveniences, um, however, the, any possible inconveniences, clearly um, the planners, the architects, have done their best to mitigate these concerns of the neighbors. Dr. Schwong um, has held numerous meetings with the neighborhood associations, has talked to neighbors. Um, clearly, there is a definite effort to minimize any kind of negative consequences on the neighboring um, houses, neighboring people, etc. Um, however, of course, as I said before, there is going, not going to be anything that's like totally perfect that is, has no consequence. However, as I said earlier, we need to take a step back and realize that this project is entirely necessary for the 200 plus students and 30 plus faculty of Bishop Seabury Academy. It is essential to continue improving the quality of education for students at the school. And I think this project will um, allow Seabury to significantly improve um, the student's education, et cetera. And so because of that, I think everyone note, notes the um, potential consequences it might have, but giving the ability for each teacher to have their own classroom, for there to be specialized classrooms for biology teachers, chemistry teachers, art teachers. We don't have an auditorium right now. We have a gymnatorium, which is a gym, a drama stage, and a place we do um, ceremonies such as convocation and stepping up. We are boxed in at the school, and simply put, we need more room. We need more uh, classrooms, we need more areas in which students can learn more effectively and learn better. And because of this, I urge you all absolutely to take into account any kind of inconveniences that may arise and do your best to mitigate them. However, I think the bottom line is this project is not only going to be useful for the students, but it is entirely necessary. And I strongly urge for you to vote on this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Hello, my name is Patsy Cote. We've lived in uh, our town home for four and a half years. We love it there, and this, the kids have been great. The pool was nice in the summer. We heard their, the laughing and the fun they were having. It didn't bother us a bit. But I will just remind you all that there are six units or homes that are uniquely, clearly affected. All of the people that live on Wimbledon and up the hill and down and all around, they are not affected like we are in our six units. And if you could just take a look at some of the pictures, I think that what I'm more interested in is, I don't care about the construction and all that myself, but what I'm interested in is that the construction is kept on, on task, that the contractor is held liable. We, I have a, a certain um, prejudice uh, with contractors and construction because I think because of weather and other reasons they are not able to keep their promises they are not able to keep up and I think that this is going to be a, a case where if you want uh, everyone to be happy in the neighborhood they will make sure that the, that the builder uh, keeps on task and gets the thing done and the other question I only have is most schools are built so that there's a street around them. I mean, if you go through town, most of our elementary schools or even the other schools, they have a street. And the, the neighbors are not subjected to the back of the building. And now what is doing to this six units, what we're doing here with the six units, is this is backing right up to us. And I'm just, we're, we're a little frightened of how close they're going to do it because because <coughs> the plans change. They've got plans, but you know, well, we can't do this and we have to do this and and things will be, get changed. So we just need to all keep that in mind that we are six units sitting there with the possibility of a building that could look like a mall, back of a mall, anybody been there? Uh, and we just really don't want that. I mean, we want to be able to, you know, just still be able to enjoy. Because in these units, our front 
porches are not really a porch. We don't sit out on the front porch. We sit out on the patios in the back and the, and the um, decks, the decks and the patios. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public like to speak? Okay, with that, we'll close the public hearing and invite the applicant to come up and respond. Oh, there's one person. Oh, come on up. Public hearing is back open. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Michael Allman, full disclosure. I have a student at Bishop Seabury Academy. Um, just wanted to point out something that may not be obvious to all of you. Um, it's known, of course, that Bishop Seabury Academy was originally part of Alvamar, and what it was was the tennis facility and the swimming facility. So the buildings that the neighbors are looking at are the buildings that were compatible with the townhomes as a part of Alvamar. So the very same buildings that they're looking at now are going to be the same design as what they've been looking at all along. Now granted, the new buildings are not going to be the Taj Mahal, but it is going to be compatible with what's been there all along. And I'm sure that the architects are going to make every effort to make it look not like the back of a mall. Um, Granted, it's going to be closer than the current buildings are. Uh, but I, you know, it just seems that if there is some landscaping involved, I don't think it's necessary to uh, completely hide this facility because it's really no different than what's been there before. So I just wanted to point that out and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right, last call on the public hearing. Anyone else? Okay, the second time we'll close the public hearing and now ask the applicant to come up. Uh, John Chamberlain, SK Design Group, uh, civil engineer on the project. I'd like to speak to a couple of the issues that were uh, brought up. Uh, first, I'd like to address the storm concerns that uh, Mr. Banning brought up. Uh, there is an existing 35-foot wide drainage easement along the north side of the property that drains or picks up the drainage that uh, is to the northwest of the property, which is the hundred and some acres uh, that currently drains uh, between or just to the north of the existing townhomes there. There's really not anything that we can do with that particular drainage issue there. I mean, that's a pre-existing drainage issue with a pre-existing uh, water flows that were established by previous development. What we can do is we can address the stormwater that we are creating with our new site. Uh, based on the current plan that is in front of you, the actual impervious area on the site decreases with the overall or the ultimate built out. So we are increasing the, the impervious area that will ultimately be there as opposed to what is there now. We're also aware that along the back of the six townhomes that are the closest uh, to the proposed building addition, that we have a fairly flat area in there that does not drain real well right now, and we are addressing that with additional underground storm sewer, which we will pipe around the west and the north side of the addition and take it over and dump it into the drainage easement along the north side of the property. So we feel like that uh, we're, we're trying to do the best that we can to address uh, what drainage <laughs> issues that are there. Uh, there's some that we really can't do too much about, which are the existing ones there along the north property line. Uh, another issue that was raised was the existing sanitary sewer line, which is an eight inch line, which is along the back side of the six plaques. Uh, that line there is actually a private line. Uh, construction will not impact that line. We don't have any construction that is over that line. Closest thing that we have is a, is a parallel storm sewer line, which is approximately 15 feet away from it. The sanitary sewer for our facility will come out of the north side of the building and will go straight <coughs> north. It'll tie into a 12-inch city sewer main that runs along the south side of the 35-foot drainage easement. So we shouldn't have any impacts to that uh, 
sanitary sewer line uh, that was raised, the question was raised about, uh, and we can go as far as putting caution notes on the plan to, to make sure that the contractor is aware that line is there uh, so that there wouldn't be any damage to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. touch again about the comments about the back side of the building for the school this really isn't the back side of the building what we are embarking on is a full um, science wing for the four science classrooms that was one very very important addition in you know that's that is justifying this um, entire phase one expansion piece each of those science rooms will have a door to the exterior and one thing that's been really, really important throughout the design of, of all of these new spaces is that we bring in as much daylight as we possibly can because they actually have some internal classrooms within the main classroom building that don't have daylight at all. So in future phases, we'll be turning the inter interior classrooms that have no daylight into a black box theater and moving those classrooms to the exterior of the building where they will get natural light. That happens in phase two. Um, but currently, the classrooms that go around the perimeter of this phase one expansion are science classrooms, which will have windows and doors to the exterior. So it's, it's not like a back of a shopping mall with absolutely no fenestrations. Um, in, in response to the landscaping issues again and providing a good screen, there's a pretty substantial amount of existing large cedar trees on that property between the sixplex. We're planting more on our side uh, closer to the, to the southwest end. I can see that there's a break between the existing cedar trees that are beyond our property. M maybe the city would let us move a couple of the trees that we have further east over to fill that gap. Maybe that's a way to, to resolve that. Great, thank you. Can I make just a 30 second comment? Sorry, sir, we may have questions for you. If we do, that would be your time for your 30 second comment. I'm glad to answer. Thank you. All right, so we'll bring this back up to the commission for questions, comments, and maybe a motion eventually. I have a question. Yes, Commissioner Buckley. Can you show us on, the, on a picture where the sixplex is because it looks like there's already trees behind it that's not uh, is it in this the picture you have is no we have um this is the uh, first there's a um, second picture no i don't know I can turn on the GIS too if you need me to. And so we're talking about the residences by right, right there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, yes, those trees. Uh, I, I, sir, I was just asking Becky a question. Thank you. And then I do have a question for Mr. Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain, your comments were talking about a pre-existing correct drainage issue. Correct. Is the draining issue drainage issue on Seabury property or is it No, there's actually there's a large uh, box culvert that comes underneath Wimbledon Drive right here. Okay. Then there's an existing drainage easement that comes along the north side of the sixplex. Okay. And then it turns and goes due east along the north side of Bishop Seabury's property and ultimately ties into the creek down here just to the east of Bishop Seabury's property. So what I was referring to is there's nothing we can do about this because this drainage is set by all of this property to the northwest that drains through the box and then comes down this existing drainage easement. What we can address with the project is here along the south side of the sixplex, 
This area back in here around the pool is pretty flat back here in this area and it doesn't drain real well. So if you look at the information that was in the development plan on the grading and utility plan, we've gone in here and we've put in a new storm sewer system that wraps around our proposed addition, goes to the northeast here and then goes east and then ties back into this existing drainage channel. And we've put that storm sewer in to alleviate these drainage issues that are existing back here just due to the flat grades and that there's no storm sewer back there right now, okay? And then the other thing that we're doing is these tennis courts here and here, those will be removed with the project. Those will be converted back to turf area. So that's part of the decrease in the impervious area in the overall plan by, you know, although we're building a new addition here and there's a future addition that will go in this area and even some back here in the back, all of that phase one and phase two addition is still less impervious area than what is out there currently. Thank you. Okay. Um, the end of the staff recommendation, recommendation says in forwarding the request to the city commission with a recommendation of approval including the following waivers reduction of required bicycle party parking from 43 to 12 is determined to be acceptable by the city engineer um, so I'm just wondering like based on our um, comprehensive plan and bicycle and pedestrian <coughs> issues task force and um, bike ped plans that you know we are trying to encourage bicycling and someone had mentioned this is sixth through twelfth grade which means two years of that can drive um, and I, I understand that what they're saying is because it's a regional um, it's a private school so it's regional uh, that they're asking for that but to me it doesn't make sense to reduce that bicycle parking from 43 to 12. Um, I mean I know kids who live four miles from that school who bike um, and as an encouragement measure it just seems like 12 would not be adequate for for that um, and it seems interesting to me in a town that we keep saying we want to encourage multimodal transportation. We want to encourage people. We want to allow people to bike. That um, we're always okay with adding spaces and then doing traffic calming. But adding car spaces, I should say, and doing traffic calming because we've uh, added parking lots and the streets have no parking and then they go faster. So we get requests to calm streets and then saying, but it's okay to take away bike parking when it's required. Um, so that's both a question and a comment, I guess. And I, I was gonna say this later, but as a parent um, of three children at Raintree Montessori School and not living within two and a half miles of Raintree, my children biked every single day to school for a year. One of them was six years old and it was 18 degree weather. And we didn't stop um, because we wanted to. Um, so it just seems like, to me, we shouldn't be reducing bicycle parking, but always adding car parking for 6th to 12th grade, so. Uh, well, as a school, that is part, part of our culture is to encourage uh, bikes and encourage riding. Um, and with all the encouragement we do provide, and if you could meet my athletics director, you would know. He keeps his bike in his classroom as a visible symbol of all he stands for. And, we, and, and not to make light of this, it's just trying to encourage them to do that and them actually doing it are two different things. Uh, I know you're not asking for this. We would never be able to compel students right. uh, to force them to ride their bikes. Uh, we definitely encourage them to do so. Uh, starting with the parking itself, we, there's no question, and I, I don't think that's being called into question the necessity for the additional parking. If you look at the size of our school and what our 
faculty and, and upper school student body will be. We already have about five cars daily that are on the frontage road. So we do not have enough parking for our future capacity. As for the um, bicycle racks, the ones we have right now are only half full. And so uh, the idea of having 43 uh, bicycle racks, I don't think it will increase uh, the biking of students. They will sit empty, and we just think it's excessive, 43. I agree, 43 might be excessive, but I think we're at this kind of juncture in Lawrence where um, the reason people aren't biking is because they don't feel safe doing it. And you can't get people to feel safe doing it until you encourage them enough. So although it might not be a Bishop Seabury problem and 43 would it be, I mean 43 spaces at Raintree would seem a little out, a bit outlandish. Um, I guess maybe I'm bringing it up more because I see it as some sort of issue that needs to be addressed on a city scale rather than a specific project scale, but it seems like a reduction from 43 to 12 might be for future you reference if we're building a city that will allow for all those modes for future reference 12 might be too few but that's just a based on the plans i've seen and the vision of of future lawrence so Scott Zaremba, I'm the uh, president of the Board of Trustees. Hold on, Bishop Scott. Seabury. Wait a minute. Did we have a question directed to the public? I was answering, I was going to answer what she had to say. I'm not public, I'm part of our, our group. Okay, so <laughs> let, let's keep it at one answer. What, what I don't want is I don't want every member of our Bishop Seabury group coming up to speak on each question that comes out because we'll be here for a while. I'll, I'll give we'll you a moment. Less than 10 seconds. Love it. Take it away, Cole Scott. told me that. Uh, and, and all I was going to say is as things, as things progress and we add more people and we have that ability, um, you know, we'll expand those things. And that's, that's working with everything that we do inside the school and outside the school. As things progress, we progress with them. And that's, and that's what part of this whole process is today, is to be able to progress. And so in no way if something came to that point, we're going to expand as those things come to light. It's putting things too far ahead that, that we just don't want to see a bunch of things that are empty. And so I agree with you, but you know, we'll move forward with them. That's it. And that's always been our motto in everything that we do. He didn't even start the timer. I trusted you. Some of these institutional uses have been difficult to judge. If I recall, um, LMH may have received a reduction of sorts because the code requires compared to the car, so many <coughs> bikes that we just know aren't there. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at Sports Pavilion Lawrence, you see a lot of bike racks that the code required, and I can't recall if that got a, a reduction or not. I think that may have been with a reduction even. Um, I do think, though, one thing that some of these institutional uses offer that other sort of compact developments don't is the space to add if, if there is a need for it later. So I, I really appreciate the discussion that we need to show that there's opportunity on these different modes of transportation. Um, but uh, but that's, the, that's kind of the discussion that we have internally in our recommendation to you. And it it's, then becomes your recommendation in this issue to make a recommendation to the city commission. So if there's, we thought it was a balance here because the um, population isn't changing drastically and they provided information about what their current demand is and it does uh, double that um, supply anyway. Right, but I think it's more of a question, and like I said, I don't know that this is a, it's a, I mean, that's unfair because this is what we're talking about, but, but it's, it's more of a what drives what, right. and if you're, if you're planning, I mean, we had you know, national speakers come out and speak about this, but if you're, if you're planning for cars, you're getting cars, but, where does that begin? That discussion will probably happen quite a bit. It's happening right now, but we, you just need to go out and experience places like the hospital or like Bishop Seabury to see the cars are what's 
but what we do need to manage uh, in a large degree and, and accommodate the other modes of transportation. Commissioner Payton, I'd encourage you to read carefully our new comprehensive plan on this issue because we have spent a lot of time talking about cars. I, I have a question for staff to, towards Mr. Banning's question. Um, I did have a chance to sort of drive around there and, and see some of those townhomes today and I, I used to live in townhomes like that over when I lived in Topeka. So that is, in my opinion, a little different multifamily <laughs> situation than our, our uh, the way I think we, we most often think of multifamily. Our, this may sound like a loaded question. Are we, missing, is, are we missing a piece of the code that separates that townhome multifamily? Because we want to promote density, but yet if the setbacks are, or the screening is different, is that something we ought to look at in the future or make allowances for now? What are your thoughts on that? So the buffer, it's a question of buffer yards. Yeah. And the buffer yards are dictated by zoning districts. Right. And schools are allowed in many residential zoning districts. So it's really a use issue though, more than a zoning issue okay. in my mind. It's also just a function of how the townhomes were situated on their lot when they were developed. <clears throat> so they're fairly close to the property line as the school wants to be as close to, you know, to mm -hmm. meet the code required setback. Um, and then what the zoning code states and what it acknowledges or what it puts forth is that those two uses are compatible because they're allowed in the same district or this one's permitted with a special use permit so you do have the ability to look at that as a special from the special use permit perspective and try to mitigate any issues and i think that um, that's why the, the applicant is bringing forth some more landscaping where a buffer yard isn't required so from a code perspective that's how the code looks at it but you do have through the special use permit process, uh, a mechanism to mitigate impacts if they're, you know, if you if you think that they reach a degree that they need to be mitigate, mitigated. Okay. So I have a question for the applicant. You guys can decide amongst the four of you which one this one's going to be towards. But the request has been made for a fence, and there currently mm -hmm. is a fence that exists. You could argue that if the neighbors want a fence, they could build their own fence on their property line. But as Scott has said, this may be an opportunity to mitigate some of those concerns. Do you guys want to address that question? Scott's thinking there's already a fence there on their property. Ooh, pardon me. We have a fence around the pool, and that's kind of a vestige of the pool, and that right. sets like 10 feet inside the property line. So that was going to come out with the pool. I, I think we'd probably rather mitigate it with landscaping if we can. Um, and is it defining the zone is, I think, what's what the important piece is. Is it just I think it's just that sixplex there that we're talking about on that. Let's see. Oops. Yeah, Across I think here, right there. where there is substantial existing screening on their side, and then we've kind of um, sprinkled our buffer yard around that. And I saw a gap in our landscape plan that looks like we could fill with something. Would, is that the main concern? Because there already is quite a bit of. Can I answer that question? Yes, please. I Go up. Do me a favor, Bob. Come up to the mic. Let me see if I can work this, kid. As I understand it, from what Miss Day told me, if these were single-family houses today, the buffer from the line would be 35 feet, not 25 feet, to the school. And secondly, it would require a what did she say? Impervious is not the right word, but it would require substantial landscaping to buffer yard. Buffer yard. Mm -hmm. So, but since we're a multi-use, I believe we'll find that our building is about 35 feet to the line, and the proposed building is about 25 feet to the line. 
and there's no there's no uh, landscaping in that section that's shown. They do so. Let's see. In this area right up here, they're going to take out a tree, and there's a there's a pump house or something, and they're going to put some landscaping in here. But there's no landscaping that I saw in the plan that runs along this line behind the building. Um, <coughs> you have. Uh, let's have staff. Can <coughs> Becky? Can you pull up? We've got plans on here that show where some of that landscaping <coughs> is. Maybe this is just lost in some of the. Drawings. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's, that's great. Okay, so the trees we're looking at right here, they're about, uh, they're about five or six that are, are cedar trees that are on our property. Some of them are dying already, and they're going to die. They're reaching that point where they are going to die. We do have some other trees there. But you see, you see no landscaping here, and we're 25 feet from the line. You're, you're seeing there are existing trees on the yeah. other side. The, that's correct. The this green, the green colored, are the proposed trees for mm -hmm. this project. Mm -hmm. And so, I, what I'm understanding is the applicant is saying that they're filling in the gaps to the screening that's there, but not adding a layer on their side, which could be considered through this discussion. Correct. Well, that's what I proposed earlier that you rethink when you have a condominium like this whether you're going to going to have the spacing requirements to be the same as they would be for a commercial apartment building okay thank you so scott you said earlier and i'm just trying to follow this train of thought that if those were single family homes the setback would have been different from the back of their house to their property line is that correct mr banning is making the case that that's a 35 foot setback i don't have the code memorized that, that that could have been um, the same, but the buffer yard treatment would be different. Would be different. Okay. Um, yeah, the applicant would have a choice of buffer yards mm -hmm. from narrow to wide and then populate that with different densities of plant material. Okay. But, but, but I do think what I'm hearing the applicant say is that they're willing to look at filling in more of that line um, with with trees, that may be something we we discuss. Is that something we need to address as a possible condition, or is that something that's going to happen between the applicant, staff, and the, and the it, residents? It would need to be put forth as a recommended condition. Um, I think I'd want, to, I'd want to know if there's any constraints there to doing that. And then if it's agreed upon, then it would be a condition that you would put forth and, and mm -hmm. we could work on it later in terms of the actual plan, but we would understand your intent and direction. <coughs> oh, the stormwater engineer might mm -hmm. want to <laughs> speak to that. We were getting there. Mm -hmm. You beat us to it. <coughs> With the proposal that they have, um, they're taking out about 8,500 total square feet less than what they have today, even after they build everything out. So what they have along the uh, northwest side of the, the uh, property is they're putting in um, a storm sewer line to take care of drainage that they currently aren't taking care of right now because it's so flat. So they're going to regrade that out. If I had the grading plan up here, I could show you. But this all, they've got it drained to four different area inlets and then it'll tie into the ditch. So the drainage is going to improve with what they're doing. And if you're going to just keep in mind, if anything that you're going to put in here, and I understand you want screening, but you've also got a 15 inch pipe in here that's going to help that drainage to get out to the channel. So when you start putting trees in there, then you start messing with, with piping and stuff like that. Because typically uh, storm sewer uh, is not that deep. Unlike sanitary sewer that's along here, I know there was concern about that, but that's six feet deep that they're not going to hurt that. Right. Before you go, is there a difference? I mean, shrub root depths, tree root depths. It's just any roots Shru around. Shrubs that. is yeah. That's not, that's going to be a problem. It's the tree roots is what I'd worry about getting into storm sewer. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, I, I just want to ask. 
maybe Scott can do this, but there was in one of the comments, I, I just like an explanation from staff about how special use permits tie into construction timelines and what this special use permit is actually for and why there's no time limit on it. Well, the, the a special use permit approval, once approved by the city commission, has an expiration of 24 months. They have to pull a building permit within 24 months, or they can seek, or they have to seek an extension of that. So there's a couple of different extensions that they can obtain and keep their special use permit approval active. But our code does have a sunset on any use like that if a building permit isn't pulled. But there's no requirement to complete construction in any time frame. And I wouldn't recommend that there be, be one established. What else is on our minds related to item two? <laughs> so Scott, how may you see, how might you suggest we look at providing some direction if we were to look at asking the applicant to work with the, the property owners to develop a adequate buffer there? Well, I mentioned I'd like to know what the constraints are, and Matt brought up a pretty good mm -hmm. constraint mm -hmm. with the storm sewer. So um, you, can, you can get a sense of how many things we have to balance on the site right. to come out with a, a project that everybody can be satisfied with. Um, that's a good question, I'm not sure. I mean, if it has, if it has fencing um, and landscaping and we're filling in some gaps, I think the effect is going to be to be there for it. Um, and it's a, you know, from a code compliant standpoint, it is code compliant. Okay. Thank you. May I make a suggestion? Please. My job is problem solving. And one way, if this sounds amenable to the, the neighbors, um, what if we replace their trees? What if we take their trees out and put new trees in and cut the cost of that? Then it looks like we've solved the uh, concerns. Thanks. Well, thanks for that offer. So that, that, would, that raises in my mind a question for the stormwater engineer. How far away do the trees have to be from your new stormwater pipe? Oh, if they're back over where they're currently at, where they're replaced, they, that'll be fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the deal. She raised her hand. Um, our trees, I mean, thank you. That's really nice of you. I He's a really nice guy. <laughs> we've known him now. That's what I've heard. Um, <laughs> the, the problem is we've got some pear trees that are really beautiful right now. I mean, we wouldn't want those to go out necessarily. They're on our property, right? And then we, there's cedars that were planted years ago. Some of them are getting pretty crummy looking. But, you know, it, they're better than <coughs> nothing, so we're keep, keeping them. So that's the only problem with that. My only concern is, is the is the building is going to be too close and is there can there be a fence like we have a fence around the pool and that's never been a problem I mean, I mean do you put a fence instead of trees that will go down the roots can you do that the engineer or who was it that talked about this? the tree roots well can we put a fence where our trees would go like in the one that's there right now it, it, does anybody want to do that or is that not a good idea? I can speak to clarify is there a fence there now? That, that's my I'm a yeah, bit confused. I'm confused because I've heard there is a fence. The fence is there around the pool. It's a it, chain it, fence? It, no, it's no, a nice, it's, it's a wooden fence. And, okay. and I, I, I guess my concern, or I don't have a concern, but you're looking at a six foot fence versus a 
20 some foot building, so you're still going to see the building. Oh, <laughs> right. I know, but it kind of breaks it up a little, maybe. And maybe you put bushes in front of it because you can't put trees because they're going to go down and ruin the sewer. Yeah. I, I guess from my perspective, if you put any kind of structure for a wooden fence, one, it's a maintenance nightmare for them. If it ever falls down or has a problem, you're going to have uh, issues with it. Sure. It's easier to grade around and landscape around if it's just an open. Bushes. Well, you can put bushes in there, but you could, it's easier to get overland flow to get through there, too. So. Mm -hmm. See, this is what it looks like in a, 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 mm -hmm. from a, the air. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to see if the, they could look at it and see what we're up against here. It's pretty stark. Okay. Here, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> so sometimes we do this in the spirit of problem solving, but sometimes it can get away from us as well. And so we want to make sure that our commissioners, we, you guys can make the greatest deals in the world standing here, but it's got to be as part of our motion and it's got to be. So if I think we understand that there's bushes here, there's trees options, there's good trees, there's bad trees. It does sound to me like the, like the school is willing to work with the neighbors to come up with a solution. Commissioner Butler has a brilliant idea to address this. I do not have a brilliant <laughs> idea at all. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming. And we see this a lot with um, various plans that come in front of us and, and, and you know, certain groups want different landscaping or trees or lighting or, or what have you. Um, and I think, I can't remember which commissioner um, commented before, but the residents of the sixplex do have the option of putting up a fence um, at their cost on their property or doing what they would like on their property. And I just have a, a hard time when um, people come in front of us with various plans and then we have neighbors that are very entitled to comment on those plans, but they don't own the property. And I think it's important that we do look at the property owner, owner's rights and their ability to develop their property and align with our code and um, various conditions that um, are placed on that property so uh, i do and i am encouraged that you guys are willing to work together and i encourage you to do that but i'm not um, a fan of requiring additional uh, money spent on a particular fence that the neighbors would like or particular trees that the neighbors would like but uh, i do think that this is a good plan and i really like um, Miss Griggs, I, I appreciate you coming and speaking to us, and I am always impressed when our youth come and give us their opinion, so I do appreciate you coming tonight. Um, but I, I, I just encourage us. I, it looks like Bishop Seabury has done uh, a very good job of working with the neighbors, and I think the students do deserve uh, classrooms that are appropriate of size and uh, help their learning. So I, I'm in to support this as drafted and as proposed to us this evening thank you Scott would it would it give you enough direction if, if we if we said that you have so many trees that are currently on the property in the site plan as it currently stands and that working with both the applicant and the neighbors if they wanted to move one of those trees to another space so to Commissioner Butler's point, that wouldn't be additional expense for the developer because the developer is following the code here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's really it. Mr. Banning, you bring up a good point. We maybe have to address that in the future, but they're following the code. In fact, I think they've gone beyond the code on the number of trees that they've put in. <coughs> but if there was a benefit to screening, I mean, part of this is working out with the storm drain and the <coughs> fence and who's going to pay. I'm, I'm in Commissioner Butler's camp. I, I think... You guys can always, the neighbors can always put in more trees and they can put up a fence. At the same time, I also understand that this is something that's being done on a property that's adjacent and boy, since they're doing it, they might as well make your life better too. We get that. We hear this a lot. Um, but if they're meeting our code and our job is land use, that seems like a reasonable, they've gone beyond the code here. Now, if it helps you, Scott, to give some direction of I saw three trees that were sort of spread out in other spots, you know, that maybe those could be moved to help mitigate screening. Does we that give those, you enough direction there? Yeah, we can make those um, changes administratively. They're considered very minor in nature. Okay. <clears throat> in that 
being said, there's never anything that pro prohibits the neighbors from working with the applicant throughout the entire process and working out something else. I mean, just because we say <laughs> you've met the code and your project can go forward, there's still a lot of room that people, that they want to be good neighbors. You want to be good neighbors to the school. So, you know, there's a lot of pluses here. And I, and I, trust there's a lot of trust and I, and I also see there's a lot of willingness to communicate and work together. So I'm encouraged by that. So that if we go forward and improve this as it's, it's proposed to us, I, I see that this can work out for both the neighbors and the applicant. I mean, you are a neighborhood. This is essentially, even though it's not a public school, it's a, it's a neighborhood school there. It is part of what makes your neighborhood your neighborhood. So I'm, I'm encouraged to see that there is this communication going on. Any other comments or motions? We can always discuss after a motion is made. Commissioner Butler. Um, I recommend approval of the special use permit for Bishop Seabury Academy, the school use located at 4120 Clinton Parkway, and forwarding the request to the City Commission with a recommendation of approval, including the following waivers listed in the staff recommendations and subject to the following conditions listed in the staff recommendations. I have a motion. Second. Second, Commissioner Culver. Any further discussion? Can there be any more questions from the audience? <laughs> Only if we have them. <laughs> we may ask you questions. <laughs> okay, if there's no more discussion, we'll, uh, we'll take a vote. I will say before before we vote, I, I want to echo what Commissioner Carpenter said in that it's great to see, you know, almost every letter we got communicated the, the goodwill between the, the school and the neighbors and, and the value that that neighborhood puts on, on having the school there. Um, and it's encouraging to hear um, the, the school and the neighbors trying to continue to work together. You had a meeting beforehand, you got th lots of stuff seems worked out before we got there, and then you came here and everybody is in the mode of problem solving, so that's exciting mm -hmm. to see. We don't always see that, so we want to encourage that and continue. I also want to address our young lady who spoke to the group. That's a tough thing to do. You did a very nice job. We save that signature sheet, Scott. That'll be valuable someday. Um, <laughs> She did a great job, and we'd like to see more of youth like you involved. I encourage you to read our new comprehensive plan, <laughs> which we joke about, but it's really being written for you, and I hope you don't leave this community. Um, but that plan is being written for you, and it needs to reflect what's important to you. Um, quite honestly, a lot of us won't be here when that plan is fully um, done. So. It's great to see someone getting involved in planning. Done as in the plan is not like we, sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it, Scott? Yes, yes. All right, so I'll call for a vote on item number two. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. Passes 7-0. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. We've been at this for an hour and a half. We have a commissioner who just arrived late. We're going to take a five-minute break, and we'll come back at 8-12. Thank you.
Scott. Are you ready? Can we start now? <laughs> okay, we're going to step back and do our meeting here. Gotcha. And we are ready to move on to item number three. Go for it. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Luke Mortensen, City County Planner. Uh, and the next item will be a request to rezone a number of subject properties on Atchison Avenue and Yankee Tank Lane. Uh, presented by, or this, submitted by Grobe Engineering on behalf of Yankee Tank Estates LLC, which is the property owner of record. So uh, it's not a perfect lot or uh, parcel that we're looking at. This is a floodplain overlay that covers a number of subject properties. Um, the yellow shading is a little bit tough to see, but it's within that kind of green um, border. Uh, and then we are below West 31st Street and east of Castle uh, above K-10. So currently, our little odd-shaped uh, part, you know, area is zoned RM12 uh, FP, which is the floodplain overlay. Uh, the surrounding area is zoned RM12, that's to the north and northwest. Uh, the RM12 FP extends west towards Castled, and then you have some open space with the floodplain overlay to the south, and then even below that is Douglas County zoning um, agriculture and Valley Channel. So tonight we're talking about uh, removing the floodplain overlay by rezoning to RM12. Um, that little shape that you saw on the map is 2.4 acres about. It's platted. Um, the multifamily residential zoning is already in place. Tonight's rezoning is addressing only the floodplain overlay. Uh, the maximum units per acre, that, that density um, is staying the same. Uh, this rezoning will permit uh, the development that's consistent with the rest of the Yankee Tank development. Um, it brings the subject properties within that odd shape uh, into the same zoning district as the adjacent lots. And like I said, we're just removing the floodplain overlay. So the, okay, so the applicant has added uh, more than two feet of soil and has graded it to bring it above uh, 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 excuse me, has to bring it in compliance with section 20-1201 uh, that, re that regulates that uh, newly annexed properties to the city that are adjacent to floodplains and floodway are uh, given that f uh, floodplain overlay district. I'm sorry, my notes aren't showing up on the, on the PowerPoint, so I'm a little slow. But the applicant has raised the surface more than two feet above the base flood elevation. That was done with the floodplain uh, development permit at the bottom. Staff recommends approval of the rezoning request for the 2.48 acres from RM12 FP to <coughs> just the RM12 district uh, and forwarding on to city commission with the recommendation for approval subject to the following condition. The applicant must receive a letter of map change from FEMA, uh, this is pending right now, before rezoning request moves on to City Commission for consideration. Uh, and then uh, Amy Miller is our planner who handles a lot of floodplain issues. She's here tonight to answer any questions. Uh, the applicant is also here. Great, thank you very much. We may have some questions in the future. Come on up, applicant. I guess nobody left for me. Um, <laughs> Don't have much to add. Luke did a great job, I think, explaining it. I guess the only thing I'll say is, you know, that this goes back much farther than probably most people on this board, uh, commission right now. That it, you know, started in 09 when it first talked about annexation and rezoning. And, you know, we kind of have followed the rules, and hopefully this is the last piece. Um, and, you know, the overlay, um, um, you know, district is just being removed so that, you know, when somebody wants to buy a piece of property, it's like, well, what's that? How's that going to affect me and my insurance rates and that? 
Um, as, as noted, I have a uh, application into FEMA. In fact, they had a few comments. We did a little extra modeling, uh, and those revisions are going to go in in the next day or two. So we're probably 30 days from getting that final letter from them. And kind of with the FEMA process and this process, that this just ended up hitting you before that final letter from FEMA came back. And so it's fine that it's um, obviously contingent upon receiving that documents. And they not only do I receive them, but they come back to the community, which is uh, Scott's, I guess, the man in charge of, of the community from, from a floodplain standpoint. I'll be happy to answer any other questions. I mean, there's kind of more to it, but it's probably not worth discussing all the things that led up to this point, uh, unless you've got questions. Great. All right, thank you. Thanks. So I'm gonna assume there's no one behind the pillar over there. <laughs> Bring it up to the commission. Quick question. Amy, maybe you can answer this. Uh, and maybe just out of curiosity, are, sometimes does FEMA take the initiative to make map changes and then can and or are they driven by an applicant like in this case the vast majority of letter of map changes from FEMA are driven by an applicant okay whether it be the city or a private applicant okay. or a property owner um, it's pretty rare for FEMA to undertake that the only time we've seen that is immediately after we get new maps and they realize there was a major issue okay all right thanks I'm going to make a motion to recommend approval of the rezoning request for approximately 2.48 acres from RM12 FP district to RM12 district and forwarding it to the city commission with recommendation for approval based on the finding of fact <coughs> found in the body of the staff report and subject to the condition listed. Second Commissioner Culver. Any further discussion? Is there any reason we can't wait for the FEMA uh, letter? Um, waiting for the, the letter of map change would delay the applicant um, because it has to go to planning commission first and then ultimately then goes to city commission. At this point we felt that it was a good, um, a good faith effort on the behalf of the city to let it move forward from planning commission but hold it for consideration for city commission approval to receive that letter of map change. There is a current structure under construction. Um, in this subdivision that is part of the Dash FP overlay district mm -hmm. that we would like to finish out um, and therefore time is a little bit of a concern. So we were trying to help shorten the process just a bit. The, st the structure is being constructed under the FP regulations right. and with, with the, one of the solutions was to allow a gravel driveway because the impact of having the FP overlay is that there are requirements over and above the, 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 the normal code related to the amount of impervious surface material that you put in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. So they could meet the code. They don't desire to have a gravel driveway forever um, in this particular area, but they're code compliant. If they get the rezoning and FEMA accepts the, the map change, they can then finish the driveway and have a paved driveway. So it does not become effective unless FEMA accepts that, that ch map change, though. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand. Passes 8-0. Thank you, Luke. He's still my vote for Rookie of the Year. <laughs> All right, item number four. Okay, again, Luke Mortensen, City County Planner. Item number four is considering a variance from the right-of-way width for a minor subdivision uh, for Eagle subdivision number two uh, out on West 6th Street. And this was an item uh, from Sandy Day. Again, she's at the conference right now. So the minor subdivision we're talking about is the Eagle subdivision number two 
On the left is uh, the Eagle subdivision as it is today. Uh, and on the right is how the applicant proposes it will be after the minor subdivision process. Um, it will be a consolidation of lots uh, in terms of getting rid of all those lots on the west side and consolidating it in order to develop into a medical office use. Uh, the minor subdivision and the site plan that we are looking at uh, that Sandy is handling is an administrative review process, and so that would not normally come before you. Uh, what's coming before you tonight is the um, variance from the subdivision design standards, um, and that is regulated by the Land Development Code. So the site is uh, the portion of West 6th Street uh, right of way to the north of 1803 West 6th Street. So it's about 65 feet in width um, to the north of the outline parcel. And the outline parcel is the Eagle subdivision that I just spoke about. So the Land Development Code requires 150 feet of right of way for a principal arterial um, uh, piece of street right of way. At this point, it's just 100 feet and the existing right-of-way is 100 feet uh, from Kentucky Street all the way in the east to just west of our site uh, at about 300 feet west of our site. Then it bumps up higher than the 100 feet uh, width. <clears throat> the Requirement for 150 feet of street right of way is a result of the 2000, the adoption of in 2006 of our current land development code. Um, West 6th Street with 100 feet of street right of way is a current existing condition uh, for a developed corridor. So uh, Sandy and, and staff have, have looked at the different criteria and have come to the conclusion that requiring the 150 feet of right of way would be a hardship for uh, the property owners at 1803. Um, it would require extending uh, or removing 25, extending the property line south 25 feet uh, for just that 65 feet of frontage. Um, the city hasn't required that uh, right of way dedication for other redeveloping parcels along that portion of West 6th Street. Um, last year, in October of 2017, the Planning Commission approved a, a very similar request uh, for a parcel just to the east. Um, and, and the 150 feet, the goal is more intended for uh, greenfield development or uh, principal arterials that may have more boulevards, lanes, or amenities than our um, at this site right now. Uh, there's no planned widening for West 6th Street, and like I said, similar requests have been granted for uh, other arterial streets in similar situations. And I think Sandy included a list of those in the memo. Um, if not, we can go over them uh, during the question period. And like I said, uh, a similar request was approved last year. Um, this is a potential case, Casey's project on the corner um, just to the east. Staff recommends uh, the Planning Commission approve the variance requested for the minor subdivision uh, to reduce the street right of way required uh, for Section 2810 uh, of the Land Development Code for a principal arterial street from 150 feet to 100 feet in accordance with the provisions of the Land Development Code. Thank you. Bring it up here for questions, comments, motions. Make a motion that we approve the variance requested for a minor subdivision to reduce the right of way uh, for principal arterial street from 150 to 100 um, in accordance with the provisions of the land development code for property located at 1803 West 6th Street. Commissioner Payton, motion. Commissioner Carpenter, second. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. 
passes <laughs> eight zero. Moving on, item number five. Good evening, Scott McCullough. Again, filling in for Sandy Day, who <laughs> picked an opportune time mm -hmm. to leave us for a while. Um, you've got a text amendment in front of you that would put the group home into the code under GPI district. Group home is actually a land use defined by the state that supports um, group living that, that accommodates physical or mental impairment. And the state statute requires that any time a city have zoning that allows detached dwelling land use, it must also permit group home um, land use. Group homes typically are unrelated occupants and we categorize them into in two scopes, if you will. One, um, 11 people or more, and one, <coughs> 10 and under. And so the 10 and under are the ones that are required to be permitted by right when you have detached dwellings permitted by right in a zoning district. And the other, the, the larger scale use is actually allowed to be a special use permit. And that's how our code treats the two uses. Um, as we have uh, recently been discussing with, uh, with Bird Nash, the community health facility campus um, near, the, near LMH and Bird Nash facility, they had planned to do a group home and rezone to GPI district, which would accommodate that sort of institutional use. And that's where we learned that our, that our code was in error by not having this in the GPI district. It, because we allow detached dwellings in the GPI district, we need to allow group homes. So it's essentially a cleanup text amendment to, to comply with the state statute. So. Any questions for Scott? Thank you. You're welcome. So just a quick question, clarification. So the, the group home, 10 or less is gonna be permitted in GPI and then the 11 or more is requested as special use. Correct. Okay. We anticipate the special use permit process for the, the health facility mm -hmm. project. Mr. Sands? I'd like to make a motion to for the proposed amendment TA 18-00121 amending sections of Article 4 and Article 17 of the Lawrence Land Development Code to permit group homes in the GPI district and to update the definition to align with current state legislation to the City Commission with a recommendation of approval. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second, Commissioner Weaver. Good job. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Excellent. Any other items for us, Scott? Uh, we, do we have the miscellaneous? <laughs> yeah, item? Oh, is that on there? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to, to tell you a little bit about that. Um, it's actually an item, the residential lot inventory mm -hmm. is an item that we do annually. I think we've shared it with you each year. And um, we're going to have a mid-month that reviews this more in depth. But we did want to make sure that you received it because we actually reference it in uh, application Wednesday night. OK, so, um, I, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Whoops, let me get the bookmarks here. It basically provides a report on the demand for lots, for single family lots based on building permits, the supply of lots based on plats that we record, that developers develop and, and that we record to the Register of Deeds, and then the inventory itself. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because we will be looking at it, but I just <clears throat> on page eight, if you're following along at home here, we have um, a pretty interesting is it, oh, eight, table that shows a historic comparison of lot inventory over the years. 
And the other thing this report does, it doesn't draw conclusions about anything, right? It doesn't make judgments about or point to reasons for anything. It just gives the facts, just the data on this. What's been the permit trend, which is the demand, what's been the, the supply of lots, and then how much inventory do we have left based on those two things. And what you'll see here in this table is if you look at 2012, based on the annual single family permits, and this is just single family, this isn't multi-dwelling, it's not commercial, it's not industrial. Based on this table, in 2012 we had in newer subdivisions, which is defined as 10 years old or newer, which is where the majority of our permits are issued, we had about 13 years worth of capacity left, inventory left. But you can see how that has sort of gone down each year till now we're at 2.1 years of inventory for single family lots. Um, so just keep in that newer, in, in newer subdivisions. In newer subdivisions. If you, if you count older subdivisions, you add another four and a half years worth of inventory for a total of 6.6 .6 years of inventory. Again, not drawing any conclusions about what, what that means. Um, the other things that's kind of fun to look at are the different maps. And so we provide you with um, the lot inventory over, over 10 years uh, on, on new subdivisions. So here's where they're available. Here are the ones that need infrastructure or built or are development ready in terms of being able to, to get a permit. So anything blue has been built upon, anything green has infrastructure and can take on a permit. And then we have that same map for older subdivisions. And then we just have a map that shows sort of, I know this is sideways, just where all of our development activity is over the last five and 10 years, where our permits have been issued. So kind of heat maps, if you will, about where are the, all the activity is. So we don't need to go much further with that. We can talk more about it at a future mid-month, but it is out there as a reference tool for you. So. Happy to answer questions. Thanks, Scott. We don't need to vote to receive it or anything. No, sir. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for the good of the commission until we recess until Wednesday? Anything for the bad of the commission until we <laughs> recess until Wednesday? You're not going to ask about the other one. Right? All right. Excellent. Okay. We need a motion to adjourn until our next meeting. Or to recess, yes. Second, Commissioner Sands, all in favor? Passes 8-0. Thanks, everybody. I had to do that for a long time. I know.